I want to welcome you uh, here to this call from the Center for Missional Outreach on Racial Justice 101, Helping Start the Journey. Uh, we've been producing some resources and really curating a lot of resources that are already out there uh, so that those of us who are in local churches and those of us um, who are just kind of ordinary folks out in the world and have our uh, relatives and friends and our own selves who are wrestling with what to do in this uh, particular situation we find ourselves in when there is this great awakening, at least on the part of many white folks, uh, to the um, overwhelming evidence of racial injustice after the murders of uh, Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery, among others. Uh, this is a time to uh, take advantage of the energy that is behind this uh, moment to be able to learn, to teach, and to take transformative action. So let's begin with a prayer. A cup of cold water. That's what you asked for, O Lord of justice and mercy. A cup of cold water for the little ones striving to make their voices heard. A cup of cold water for those who march out of anger and despair, out of a persistent hope for a better tomorrow, a tomorrow where they and we won't be so thirsty. Why does hospitality matter so much to you, Lord of all creation? Why does the way we treat the thirsty among us, the way we welcome a prophet who tells us the truth about ourselves that we can barely begin to hear, the way that we welcome those whose righteousness is coarser than ours, more lived in than ours, matter so much to you? Why do you keep insisting that the best way, perhaps the only way to see you, is to welcome, is to love our neighbor? Why are you with those who cry for justice? Why are you with those who are thirsty for righteousness, or maybe just thirsty from walking the streets and are hot with anger and unrest? A cup of cold water, that's what you asked for, O Lord of justice and mercy, Lord of hospitality and the blessed community. That doesn't seem so much really, except that it might just begin to change our world. In Jesus' name, amen. That prayer comes to us uh, from umcdiscipleship.org, our general board of discipleship, um, which you can find online, and they have a uh, daily prayer uh, that can be sent to you if you sign up for that, and the project is called Praying for Change. Daily Prayers for Anti-Racism. Praying for Change, Daily Prayers for Anti-Racism. So that may be something that helps you with your own uh, worship creation or your own uh, discipleship. So I encourage you to look that up. We have a couple of other announcements that I'd love to lift up for, um, for all of us, ways that you might be involved uh, and take advantage of some things that are going on. Um, we have... Of course, a number of resources online, and we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, but Dr. Branda Furman, who's here with us, uh, leads on Wednesdays at 1.30 p.m. Is that still correct, Dr. Furman? Okay. Uh, Black Coffee Discussions on Faith, Transformation, and Leading When You Can't See the Light at the End of the Tunnel. And this is a conversation that she uh, curates for non-white leaders and change agents who are struggling um, through this time. Updated to Thursday, same time and same link. So Thursdays at 1 p.m. And I will try to send that out to all of our participants afterward. And we also have uh, some summer cohorts that uh, we're inviting, especially those who are in the kind of greater DFW area to participate in that are uh, being led in uh, partnership by some United Methodist clergy and um, our friends at Life in Deep Elm, which is a, 
uh, non-denominational church there in kind of downtown and deep Ellum uh, that is part of a, 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 a collaboration that is uh, expanding and we're, we're figuring out what where this is going to go but it's a six-week cohort in which will be paired with others from around um, around the DFW area from a variety of contexts um, in which will really focus on uncovering and healing from systemic racism. Now this is a, a uh, project that is um, geared toward white clergy to get white clergy and their churches off of the sidelines on race, knowing that this is something that many have spoken to and, and been awakened to over these last few weeks and that it has to continue and the only way to continue that work is if you have an accountability system in place to do that and some structure in place. Otherwise, things will go by the wayside and that cannot happen. So a little bit about this conversation here today. Uh, we're joined by uh, some guests who are here uh, with us on, for a panel conversation, Reverend Dr. Miranda Furman, who is with Union Coffee as community curator and the planting pastor for Sunday Spread. Uh, Reverend uh, Holly Vandell, who's Associate Minister for Mission and Advocacy at First Church Dallas, and Reverend Ashley Ann Seip, Associate Minister at Fellowship United Methodist and Trophy Club, and Reverend Chris Yost, who's Senior Pastor at Wesley UMC in Greenville. So we have a variety of, of contexts and backgrounds, um, and so we're going to get to a panel conversation here in just a minute. The reason we're having this conversation about Racism 101 and tools to help us engage in these conversations uh, is that uh, this struggle is just beginning. This seems like a massive uh, sea change for many, uh, but the movement to produce the policy changes and uh, political shifts that have to happen in order to uh, protect black lives, brown lives, all lives in this country is just beginning in this new moment. You know, some are calling this the uh, 21st century civil rights movement. And as you know, that movement and the struggle for black, the black freedom struggle lasted many years decades. And so we know that the, the working out of uh, the vision that is, it is being fomented right now is going to take a lot of work. This is not something that we can just tweet about and get on social media about um, from, our, um, from our armchair. This is going to take some work and some commitment. And one of the things that's necessary is that we step forward uh, to help one another, as uh, white folks especially, who are wrestling with concepts that are uh, they're just awakening to, like systemic racism, or racial bias, or white supremacy, or that it's not only membership in the KKK that uh, makes you a part of racism and white supremacy. Terms like defund the police and uh, reparations are now mainstream in our conversation. And it's disorienting to suddenly gain the eyes to see and the ears to hear, especially when white folks like me wake up and these terms and these realizations begin to call into question your identity. An identity bound up at what it means to be an American, a Christian, uh, perhaps male, uh, female, uh, and white, even though we often don't like to think of that term. It's terrifying to begin to think of this place in a political and theological and economic system shaped by white supremacy since well before 1619, when the first uh, African persons who were enslaved came to the shores of North America, not of their own volition. So we have a number of tools that we are um, 
trying to push out and will continue to do so in uh, sets. So Racism 101, some resources that are books and written resources, as well as some Racism 101 videos that might be helpful for those who are really just starting out in their conversation. Uh, and you can find those at um, ntcumc.org and you can go to our missional outreach uh, page and on our menu it will be right there under anti-racist resources. Uh, we're going to be working with our colleagues in the Center for Leadership Development on ways to talk with uh, children, uh, help youth to be able to process the uh, what they see on television and on uh, social media and be able to have conversations um, about how do you raise white kids to be anti-racist um, because you have to talk about these things. Uh, and we'll have some other some other resources as well, like um, for local churches, how do we, how might we be able to think about the way that we um, run as a local church, the decisions we make uh, in terms of budget, staffing, worship, uh, the way we do hospitality and um, communications and media, to think about how can we be welcoming and inclusive of all. Uh, but also kind of put ourselves in positions where we can be welcomed and included by by others as well, uh, particularly persons of color. So um, as we get into uh, the panel conversation in just a minute, I want to share with you a little bit about um, my story, because I think it, it may help us to begin to think about why uh, it's important for us to engage in these conversations and engage some, with some of these tools uh, and lean on some of our, whom I consider experts in pastoral uh, ministry and ways of engaging people in justice conversations. So I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas, which as many of you know, is um, uh, home to the uh, 1957 Central High Crisis, uh, which after the Brown versus Board of Education de decision in uh, the Supreme Court, uh, was one of the first uh, major battles uh, that gained national attention for desegregation. Um, that environment, um, the uh, Little Rock was quickly split by white flight. Um, the white powers that be um, resisted desegregation uh, at every turn and only uh, within the last 10 years did the Little Rock, uh, at least school district, come out from under uh, federal desegregation oversight. Uh, and it probably should still be under that oversight. Um, so we lived in uh, what was a white working class part of town and um, after, in the 80s and 90s, um, had more integration of uh, black families. And so my family moved out to um, uh, the white uh, redneck suburbs, as you might call it, um, to escape uh, an increasingly black community. Um, I grew up actually in a neighborhood though, that was um, our house, in front of our house was uh, Vernon and Mary Black who were black, and Mr. and Mrs. White lived behind us, and they were white. Uh, and so we kind of have this interesting uh, position in growing up, uh, trying to choose how to live in a position of tension racially. Um, my family uh, has several uh, Confederate generals and um, uh, other uh, Confederate soldiers, as well as some Union folks um, in their background, uh, some from Mississippi. Um, and so family history was really important to my family. And I know it is to many of our families, um, you know, in the South. And one of the things that as a young person I got into was this lost cause religion. You know, some of you will be familiar with this. It's um, a kind of civil religion that developed, uh, especially uh, after Reconstruction, 
uh, and it was particularly heightened in the 1920s and the 30s, as you saw many of these statues uh, to Confederate soldiers being uh, placed in prominent positions around our cities um, that believed that um, the cause of the Confederacy was more about states' rights. Racism was really not a part of that, um, that things were uh, going to proceed, you know, eventually into kind of a, a, a reconciled space, but uh, federal interaction or intervention um, was really what was was wrong with the the situation that created the Civil War, and so um, this is was a widespread belief. And one of the things that a family member almost recruited me into the Sons of Confederate Veterans, which is not a hate group, but as I say, you can see it from there. <laughs> you can see the hate groups from there. Uh, these are um, organizations that have chapters around the country that um, have filed legal challenges to uh, the removal of uh, Confederate statues, including the one in Dallas that's being deconstructed right now. Um, and their uh, positions are really about defending this lost cause religion and that uh, positions that slavery was really not anything to do with um, the cause of the Civil War, um, that the destruction of Reconstruction um, had nothing to do with racism, it was all about states' rights um, and those things. And I say that uh, just to say that conversations along the way uh, saved me from going down a path of more overt racism. Um, and saved me from uh, a path of not being able to confront my own family's history uh, and my own racism. And um, having grown up in the United Methodist Church in a little country church, my racism was never challenged. Uh, but having gone to a, a new church start in, in downtown Little Rock uh, called Coapa Quarter United Methodist, um, where everyone was welcome, where there was uh, racial diversity, um, those ideas were challenged and conversations uh, bit by bit were able to chip away at those um, underpinnings that didn't allow me to see uh, the truth of, of racism around me and in my own soul. And, um, you know, at one point I had a Confederate flag in my bedroom and would fly it whenever our neighbors would play rap music. Now, those are things that, if left unchallenged by friends in youth group, by friends in high school, can take you down some dark paths and can take um, us down to paths where Black lives are further in danger. And so part of our conversation as... Um, you know, the United Methodist Church over the last few years has been, how do we have discipleship pathways instead of just having people show up to worship and, and kind of receive a, a good word and kind of check off the box for the, uh, for the week? How do we help people to actually become the disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world? And I would say to you that helping our people become anti-racists is a part of that discipleship pathway. In fact, a fundamental part of that discipleship pathway because of where we live and the context in which we uh, live as, as white Christians, especially, even though white supremacy gets into all of our heads and affects and reshapes all of our souls. Um, and so I, I wanna turn now to 
our panelists because these are are folks that I really respect as persons who have um, stood up for justice in many ways in their variety of contexts and have been able to help people have conversations that are difficult, um, that the same kind of conversations that were valuable for me. And um, I'd like to just begin um, panelists by thinking about how have conversations about race um, with people who are new to talking about it, how they started for you? Um, and kind of how do you assess kind of where people are in order to uh, figure out how to respond best to them? I mean, are there, are there certain kind of turns of phrase that you kind of listen for in the way people talk and describe, you know, race or racism? Um, how do conversations generally start for you? And I'll kind of let whoever's ready uh, first go. Jump on this one real quick. Um, I'm Reverend Ashley Insipe. I'm the associate oh, pastor. Holly, can we take you off mute? Sorry, or uh, Ashley. I think I'm, am I on mute? No, we can't hear you for some reason. Okay. Ashley, I can hear you. This is Chris Yost. Go um, ahead. Maybe log back in. Can it, can it, can the everybody The rest of us can will save a spot for you uh, okay. in this conversation. Andrew, I think it's just you. Okay, so I'll keep going and maybe, maybe it's a sound issue on Andrew's end. So one it of is, the- sorry. That's okay. So one of the things I will say that has started many of the conversations that I've had with members, again, I'm out here in Trophy Club, uh, Texas, so an interesting area to be in right now as far as race conversations are, are happening. Uh, I serve alongside Reverend Edlin Cowley, and so race has been on the forefront of what we talk about just by nature of the fact of being in sort of a cross-racial appointment alongside Edlin. And one of the things that I think is most important is the conversations don't start until people know where we stand. Um, I think that's probably 100% I've noticed um, if we're not up front with, with, with where we stand on this issue, then people are able to kind of skirt around. Well, my pastor hasn't said anything about it, so we don't really need to talk about it right now. Or I'm not really sure where my pastor stands, so I'm not comfortable enough to have a conversation, those sorts of things. So I think the first thing that I have noticed is we have to be bold about where we stand on anti-racism and, and where, we're, where we're leading our people on that measure. Um, first and foremost. I'll turn it over to anybody else on the panel. Um, Ashley, thank you for that, because I, I, that is definitely a first step, um, because to Andrew's, um, the other part of Andrew's question um, is, you know, how to assess sort of where folks are and, um, and, and what type of I hear in that, what type of conversation then to, to initiate or to invite them into. Um, and what I've noticed and what we've noticed um, at Union and in the New Church Start and Sunday Spread like, is that um, when we um, make that, that stand or share that stand, um, folks feel comfortable no matter where they are um, on the spectrum in, as, as far as like, adherence to or alignment with whatever that stance is. Um, but once you make that stand, it, um, it creates an invitation for, um, for folks to begin to share whether they agree, disagree, whether they understand what you're saying or don't understand what you're saying. Um, oftentimes we can think um, taking a stand will alienate and shut down folks. Um, but in church culture, that's not the case. <laughs> in church culture, uh, between discipleship and Bible study, uh, <laughs> we have cultivated a nature um, in folks where um, they may not always feel comfortable saying it in group, but someone will say something to you as the pastor, um, as pastoral staff, um, or as a small group leader um, leading something at the church, if a stance has been taken, someone will say something to you. Um, so to Ashley's point, um, you have to take that stand um, from a spiritual leadership perspective. Um, and then once that stand is taken, you can begin to listen to folks. Um, and it's quite easy. 
Um, it's sometimes yes, there's coded turns of turns of phrase. Um, but this is something um, that folks are passionate about, however they feel about it. Um, and so it, it, it won't be hard to figure out where in the conversation or in the understanding um, of anti-racism, um, the history of racism um, in our church as well as in our communities and country, um, once you take that stand and initiate that uh, conversation. I also agree with both of my colleagues. I think that that the way we um, express this as Christian leaders is is really important in our circles and in our families. So in Anna, Texas, I was doing a Bible study and I was narrating scriptures like um, the prayer indicated in John chapter four with the woman at the well, indicating and navigating those scriptures around different race and culture and helping people to understand the Bible so often has been used to hurt um, people of color and to keep um, the same systemic racism in place. And I think it's a part of our call to really engage biblical text on this in a way that is helpful. And I think for some of our congregations, that's where you start. And if you're in Anna, Texas, you start with the Bible and you navigate those texts. I know when I was um, serving in um, a suburb of, in Collin County, um, one of the things that we did was we would have um, book studies. Um, and maybe we weren't ready for a straight up race conversation. I think we would be now um, with, with the context, but we weren't. And so we started talking about poverty. Well, you can't talk about poverty and systemic poverty without talking about racism. And so that was really our entry point. So I think there's several different entry points. Um, I think right now the news is our best asset. When we start talking about how we navigate the situations we are seeing um, with the death of um, George Floyd and um, the lynchings of black people continually in our nation, we navigate this by having conversation about it, by asking questions. And when I have a conversation with someone, um, I, um, I listen for, are they coming from a framework of individualism, which is very common for um, white people, particularly in Texas. I grew up in Texas. We're all about the individual, right? So I'm looking for whether they're navigating this, this discussion individualistically or whether they're navigating this subject systemically. Would this really um, pit, um, paradigm shift is about in our nation regarding the call for racial justice is really about systemic racism. And lots of people who are like me, who are white, don't, don't understand that. And so they're having a hard time navigating that. So really, I think to start with terms and definitions that help people give a language around um, systemic racism and the impact of that, I think is really important for our congregation. Holly's point, Holly's point is um, is really it's it, Holly's point is really important in 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 the idea of how and it's not just Texas um, religion tends to be particularly Christ, Christian religions tend to be individualistic because of our emphasis on that moment where we as individuals understand that Jesus that God right is working in our life and we have to accept that that grace working, right? And we have to accept Jesus into our life. And so church culture, despite, um, despite discipleship and despite even our mission in the UMC church is very individualistic. So one of the ways that um, at Union and then, and then it's continued through the ethos of starting Sunday spread um, sort of leverages that um, is through storytelling. And so Sunday spreads so or the church plant the format for our worship gathering began with the idea of if folks that are non-white sit at tables with folks that are white and talk and have the hard conversations, right? Put some food in their hands so they have something to do with their hands when they get uncomfortable. Um, but whiteness, white supremacy, um, white cultural um, assumptions that feed into the system um, have been internalized by all of us because we live within this country. Um, it's just that sort of as Andrew uh, uh, intimated in, in his personal story, 
folks that are non-white encounter it oftentimes earlier in their life than others. And so I have stories of realizing I held um, internalized racism and internalized white uh, supremacist assumptions um, about myself and about my family and about my community. And those stories of being 9 and 10, 11, 12, 16, 21, 29, 32, right? Um, and coming to a fuller knowledge of that as I was a nonprofit leader, as I was on mission trips, as I, right? Telling those stories of when I had that discovery, how I struggled to lay it down, and what I decided to pick back up, or what I'm trying to pick back up, um, sharing that created an opportunity for in our very individualistic church in Texas culture for white folks to say, is that what that is? Like, we do that too. And how did I do that? Um, and then for us to struggle together um, on how we're not going to do it anymore. Like, what are some things that you tried? And, you know, I tried this with my boss, but that doesn't work with my dad. And, you know, and so there's, there is no person in our churches that cannot have this kind of conversation. It is a matter of listening to where they are and just leveraging what we already do. We would never say that there is any heart condition that our gospel, that our Bible studies, that our, you know, our church cannot deal with. And this is a heart condition. This is pulling out aspects of our stories of our aunts and our uncles to you know of our 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 family members that we loved and realizing oh the name of that recipe is that's not what I thought it was okay so how can I keep the recipe and what are we going to call it now right and so um I think to Holly's point we are very individualistic but we can definitely leverage that to have that self-discovery um that then leads at union and at sunday spread we've had we've had success in people starting individually and then realizing that at where they stand um in their everyday life at work or with their friends they have the power to pull a lever in the system and do something different dr Furman, if i can leverage off that i think you're right helping people see is my soul's narrative right now um, remember what Jesus said, those with eyes to see, ears to hear. And what I find most often, now you, if you're not familiar with Greenville and Wesley specifically, we have literally one foot in the Metroplex and one foot in East Texas. There's not a suburb here, okay? And with that said, what we are challenged with is, um, and it's a beautiful combination, it's, it's not racially diverse. It is, um, you could say culturally diverse, but not, not racially diverse at all. With that said, our biggest challenge is helping people see. So what I have to do is understand that not all of my people are in a place where I can have a study. I really would probably need four different studies for people at four different parts. So what I did was I marched in Black Lives Matter and got my picture in the front page of the newspaper, okay? You want to talk about some jaw dropping? Our pastor was there. The first thing they've got to do is see that there's an issue that the pastor has acknowledged. And so uh, then, then just last week, I was in a panel here in the community where I was, uh, uh, me and the newspaper gentlemen were the only Anglo folks in the room. And it was wonderful. I felt very at home, and my church members didn't feel at home watching me being there. So, uh, you know, to, to say my job is to ripen so that people can see. Does that make sense? Ripening is the seeing and ripening. Those are the images that come to mind. Chris, I love that. And I love that because one of the things um, we say at Sunday Spread as folks um, get uncomfortable um, and realize that some things, they've got to change something themselves. Um, is don't be so tied to your personality that you can't let God do something um, new in your life. Um, and so our identities are not our personality, right? So um, context, all kinds of things impact the expressions of who, are, who we are, our personality. But at the core of who we are, particularly as Methodists, right, our, our Christians, our 
Christ followers are, um, you know, that's, and those things get expressed differently. I'm familiar with Greenville, right? Um, and how that's expressed in Greenville is just as much of an expression of how it's expressed in, in Dallas. Um, and I think sometimes we miss, we misunderstand that the way that we practice or behave um, at a particular time um, is not the same as what the value is at the core of us. Um, and so get having those studies, however we have them that make people ask themselves, what do I really value? Like, I never thought I'd be okay with my pastor marching in a Black Lives Matter march. I never thought I'd show up. I never thought, right? They might say, I never thought I would ever see or do this thing, but realize- Can I, can I jump in? So my, <laughs> what I've found is there were a few people you're spot on. They said, oh my goodness, I can't believe this. Most of them were, why did you do that? Okay. And so mm -hmm. that's where I'm like, hey, I'm glad you asked. Can I start right. with asking you, why do you think I did this? Right. Okay. Because that's the value. That's where you have the values conversation and you begin to, to have this, this conversation um, that says, these are the values that we hold as a faith community. These are the values that we hold as Methodists. And how we express that at any particular time might change, but our values haven't changed. And so I can now be more in alignment with my values or have a new expression of my values without saying, I no longer love my uncle and what my uncle did for my family by protecting, you know, protecting my family from the pillages of war, which we know are not fun in our children, women, economies are not safe during war, right? And so someone, we, I, those, those stories often how Confederate and Union soldiers were enlisted was the war was coming literally to their front door and they told the kids and the women to go hide in the basement and they walked out with whatever they had, right? And therefore you became a soldier, right? And so um, those kinds of values of like, when something's coming to your front door, you've got to respond. People understand that. <laughs> Right, that expression at that time was something that we now know will no longer work for the type of discipleship that we're that we're needing. I think, Dr. Furman, if I could say one other thing on that, I, I, I when you went back to the idea of values, I think that um, is at the heart of where I'm at right now with my people because so many people have put up defensive walls right now, right? Like the conversation is maybe started, but it is already almost at an end because people are just bringing all of their defense, all of their, um, all of their bitterness towards this conversation and people are already tired of having the conversation. And, and while that is the very essence of white privilege, right? Uh, I have to be able to dig deeper than that as, as a pastor. And I think one of the things is, is bringing the conversation away from maybe um, the tense level of let's talk about racism, but let's bring it to what are our core values to love one another? And are we fulfilling that in the way that we act it out racially, um, spiritually, emotionally within our families, all that. And so I think bringing those conversations maybe back away from some of those key words that are being played right now, um, um, and bringing it back into the essence, or are we fulfilling the call and mission of discipleship um, and our call to be uh, images of Jesus in the world by the way we're interacting with our neighbors right now? And, and then being able to um, draw out the powerful things that why our people are members of our churches, why they love each other. And then how can we draw that out of them to love people who are outside of our church and who are outside of our community and so on and so forth. I think you're exactly right on bringing it back to values. Also, Ashley, you're on point with as pastors, we have to dig deeper. Like this is the development of a pastoral edge. It's not a straight line of development. We're gonna, we're gonna have to circle around and about and the spiral's gonna go deeper and then the spiral's gonna go higher. And like, it's like a drill bit, right? You gotta go down and come back up and come down and go back up. That, and realize that at the core, like everyone, I can tell you this, though there might be ranges and different expressions, everyone is tired and afraid. I'm tired and afraid of thinking of racism and 
um, what's going to happen to my kid? And, and um, when am I going to be able to get a massage because my back is killing me? Like I'm, I'm tired and holding all of these things in my body. And, and I am sure that, that um, I, I'm sure because of the white friends that I have, that that is also happening to them. We all need massages because we're scared and tight and holding ourselves like this. Um, but we believe COVID is real just as much as we believe that racism is real. So we're not getting massages um, and we're having hard, we're continuing to have hard conversations and just doing some more, some more yoga and some more prayer. And I, that idea of digging deeper, that like, that's what we do as pastors, as chaplains, as spiritual leaders, as prayer leaders, like creating the capacity and excavating the gunk so that our folks can go deeper and have a greater experience of grace in their life from God. Well, and that, go ahead. Yeah, I just, I, I love your post, Chris. Um, yeah, COVID is real is another real issue for another panel, I guess. I think what is being um, highlighting to me, and I was looking kind of at the second prop, Andrew, um, around, because I think what, we're talking about here is really this digging deep around what script are we following as pastors so that then and if if we need to get in touch with that so that we can um, then kind of narrate that script and what maybe needs to be in a more anti-racist um, um, society and church for our congregation so I just wanted to put out there that I mean I we've studied white fragility and I, and I think um, by uh, Robin D'Angelo. And I would say for me as a white person, she um, narrates the white script better than any other source I've seen. Okay, there's lots of awesome sources out there talking right. about white privilege in the right script. But there are a few pages in there where she just lists the things that white people say to deflect the conversation of racism. And she lists them in lists, and I love a list. And I would say, when I went down that list, I went, oh, I've been studying this and teaching this a long time. And ooh, I've said that a million times. And so I think that there is this sense of growing, just like we're talking about, as growing as a pastor. And what script am I narrating for my congregation? And then how do I understand um, um, persons of colors, African American experience, what other voices am I letting penetrate that script that I can narrate differently in my own life and for uh, my congregation. And so I would just commend that because I, and I think there are lots of different ways you can get at that script, but I'm particularly listening for that. Um, and if you're a white woman, man, read that chapter on white woman tears. Um, <laughs> um, it's a, it, it really is helpful to understand how history has been narrated in that way, how socialized we've been um, about race in our country for everyone and for um, white people to understand what that white script is so we can bring people back to a discussion about systemic racism and what it is and how it's impacting people of color across our nation. And so that then we can take anti-racist action. But if we don't understand what script we're reading, we're, we're just as likely to do the thing that we've always done. So to, to that about the script, so um, voice voices, right, and, and narration are a huge part of understanding not only what story you're tapping into, but where you heard that story and where it came from which helps us understand why it might be told, right? Especially some of the things that Andrew touched on in his own personal story, um, the idea of like how the story of enslavement throughout the globe is told and why it might be told in that voice and from that perspective. Um, I know for us at Sunday Spread, um, one of the things that we've done is centered, um, centered questions, um, that are asked by different voices. Um, and so many people are asking right now, like, you know, if we're not as in, if we're not as blatantly racist as we were in the 70s or 60s or 50s or 40s, like, how is it that we keep recreating these, right? We all, 
we all came up with like, we are the world and rainbow push coalition and like, right. And, and multi-ethnic, multicultural church. Like how are we the church camp kids that like had everyone there and we're still dealing with this? How did that happen? Um, and for us in digging that out, actually two weeks ago at brunch church, which is uh, the, the shared meal service, um, there were a few of the breakout groups just as a pastoral, just as a pastoral, I guess, care thing. I had been doing a lot of pastoral care and I knew that some of, uh, so many of our folks are change agents and activists and advocates. Um, and a lot of our non-white folks were there, they just needed a safe space. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when we broke out into groups, there were a few groups, um, that were all white. Um, just to sort of, you know, throw some balances there. Um, and in those groups, the conversation was so interesting to me because they began to unravel. Um, we were centering Jane Bal James Baldwin. So I'm going to use some harsh language here. It's not an invitation um, to accept the language, um, but it was used in this way for a particular purpose. But James Baldwin in sort of uh, when... Um, ask the question, you know, um, how to sort of deal with racism and, um, you know, how does it feel um, to be the brunt of uh, violence, both symbolically and in language and physically. And James Baldwin turned the question back on the interviewer and said, why do, um, why does white society need a nigger? Like, why does, instead of asking me how it feels to be the recipient of violence, ask the, the creator of this cultural element, why do you need this cultural element to funnel violence towards? And in the all white groups, the conversation started going back to, they, they began to, they were like, okay, so when did it happen? Like, when did we start naming and targeting, right? Um, certain groups and certain people for our acts of violence. And then they started unraveling that all the way back to a shift in the 1300s between tribal kings and queens to monarchies, which were hierarchical. And we ran out of time. And so we, <laughs> we didn't like now, now I have a group of folks all on their own. We may have a small group that I then have to figure out how to make a Zoom link and what day it's going to be on and like creating flyers and publicity for it. Um, but we have a group of folks that are saying, when did the builders of society, as the folks who invited ourselves into a land and started creating structures, when, we, when did we make the decision as leaders that we needed this structure, right? Because these, these things are structures and, and weapons. Um, when did we craft that? When did we create it? Why did we create it? Who was the first? That to me was fascinating because having not, not being white, I would have never, <laughs> right? I didn't have an uncle in the Confederate Army. I didn't have, right? I didn't, I don't have pe um, roots that I can trace back to boats that were a part of um, bringing Christianity to various places. I don't have that. You know, when I go into, what's that um, genealogy thing, dot com, like my people stop um, in the Caribbean and in the Americas with with being enslaved um bills of sales so i can't trace those things but they could so they were having this amazing conversation um about how to untangle the system based on who they were and as a pastor i was afraid i was afraid to put all the white people in a group <laughs> um i was afraid that they would feel excluded i was afraid that the richness um that was happening um in the diverse groups in the inclusive groups um, wouldn't happen. And then I, I browsed through the, the Zoom room and they may have single-handedly solved it for us. And <laughs> we just got to turn it into policy. Well, on that, I, I want to turn to, um, to that second prompt uh, because I think this is something that we encounter a lot as, um, as people who are trying to have conversations with those around us, pastors or otherwise. And not all of us, not all of us are pastors on this call. So, you know, Holly, you brought up this, uh, the fact that D'Angelo really names the scripts that, that a lot of us who are white operate out of. 
And some of the very common responses um, to even bringing up the topic of race are, uh, as she names it, you know, I'm color, well, I'm color blind. Uh, I treat everyone with respect. Uh, why are we focusing on police officers when no one talks about black on black crime in Chicago? Um, I've had that a couple times recently. Uh, why uh, my family didn't own slaves. Uh, the real underlying issue is class. Uh, what about reverse racism? What about saying names of police officers killed in the line of duty? And not just George Floyd's name. What about Candace Owens' YouTube video? Uh, we need more racial unity and reconciliation. And these things are kind of are really a shield, like uh, several of you described it, to deflect from going deeper. And so I just kind of wonder, um, as you encounter those in conversations, do you kind of counter them one by one? How do you help uh, help the conversation to go deeper past those shields? I'm going to bring back in Holly's point, and I think Chris even talked about him using it, but um, getting to the heart of the matter and asking them, I, I don't do it one by one. It, it's tiring. It's the equivalent of when my four-year-old wants, it's time to go to bed and my four-year-old needs a drink of water and then needs a snack and then needs their lovey and then needs their frog lovey, not the lamb lovey, and then needs to know whether, like, right? It's, 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 <laughs> it's, it's simply a shield and like D'Angelo said, it's a stalling to the inevitable. And what, what the question is, you know, sort of as, as Chris and, and Ashley both, like, why are you asking that? Like, what, what do you, what do you feel? Like, what is the felt need that's going on there? Like, what do you need to protect? What are you afraid of? Jane Elliott, get right, <laughs> long, long time in this kind of work, which is like, what are you afraid of? When you close your eyes, what's the thing that breaks your heart? And that's where you start. And so I'm not going to talk to you about Candace Owens, and I'm not going to talk to you, right? I'm not going to talk to you about those things one by one. I'm going to talk to you about when you close your eyes, and to someone's point, when you close your eyes and you think of protesters, and you think about that it might get out of hand. What are you afraid of? What breaks your heart? Let's start there. Um, and through that, you get to all the things that, right? This is a typical discipleship question, right? You get to all the things that must come before reconciliation, confession. I'm, a, I'm afraid of, right? Repentance. I'm afraid of that because in my own life, I know when I've been in that situation, I've done and then reconciliation, right? And then, oh, so that means that I need to acknowledge and accept, <laughs> right? That's the, that's the pathway of discipleship right there, right? Um, and so it starts with that time told Jane Elliott question of like, what are you afraid of? What breaks your heart? And I think to that point, it's this idea that, um, Getting, as we get deeper and we start to hear people's fear, um, connecting that fear with the people who are, we are fighting for, right? So you're scared that if the, um, uh, Edlin and I helped lead a protest in our town, which in Trophy Club, it was ridiculous to see the My fake. best friend of 21 years and his husband live in Trophy Club and they were ecstatic about that. So thank you, Ashley. Like, you're over very the <laughs> Well, it was a big deal, right? Trophy Club is just, you know, it's this, it's this bubble, right? Where we, we kind of don't have to deal with anything that happens outside of this place is what we think. Um, and so to bring a protest to our town next to our grocery store, right? And, and, and have that and over um, the, the Facebook pages for the week before were just full of, I mean, I was astounded at what people actually thought was going to happen, right? Like not just they're gonna break all the windows and steal all the food from Tom Thumb, but they're going to just bring bombs. They're going to end up knocking down all of our doors. Like it was just the fear that I have never seen expressed by my neighbors. But in that, if we can dig that out, right? And then get to that fear of, I want to protect my children, 
right? Because at the very end of it, like these are conversations that I've had with my husband over the last couple of weeks. Like, what is it that you are fighting against? And at the very depth of him, he says, I want uh, my job as, you know, and we, that's a whole nother conversation, but it's to protect you and my girls. And if we can get to that point, then I can connect that with what is Ahmaud Aubrey's mom's job? What is, right, George Floyd, when George Floyd cried out for his mother, he summoned all of us, right? Like he summoned all of the mamas because we've got to be able to see other people's children as our own. That's the call of the gospel is that we have to be able to see that it is not just me and mine, but it is us and ours. It is the fact that we are all part of one body and one family. And I think when we can start to connect those fears with shared um, fears with one another, we can get to the basis that we're all fighting for the same thing. And it's a peace, it's peace, it's peace. I'm going to jump in real quick. I saw you. I want to jump in real quick. That is scary, Ashley, because at that fear, we don't like to talk about the confession and the repentance part, right? And this goes to Holly's point earlier about systemic. Like, we know what happens in war. We know what we as a country have done to other people's wives and daughters. We know as, as a people, as communities, what we have done to other people's dead rather than give them the rights that as Methodist pastors and ministers, we believe are important. And we don't, until we confess that in some way, shape or form to someone, that fear stays lodged in us. And the only thing we can see when someone is asking for their basic rights is when we denied as a country, as a community, as a entity, someone else's rights. I, I just wanted to weigh in a little bit about this understanding of, you know, when we're talking about so many different topics right now around racism, what, what I really, I try to do is I kind of have a framework I work from of which I understand systemic racism and I've gotten that framework from lots of different places right now I'm reading so you want to talk about race for someone who doesn't know how to do it who hasn't had experience talking about race this is a great book the United Methodist women are leading us in this they already have a study online which is incredible where you can do it. And I'll be glad to send the link out for that. Um, it talks about everything. It talks about affirmative action. It talks about school to prison pipeline. It talks about why, uh, about the N word. It, it talks about all of these subjects that, that I, I feel like we have questions about, particularly in the white community. And we need a framework to work from. And so when I'm talking to people and trying to navigate what they're asking about, because people will ask you, they say, oh, affirmative action, that didn't work. I mean, isn't that reverse racism or whatever they think about it. You have to have a framework that you're working from that's, that's bigger, that's biblical, that's about systemic racism. And what I really like to bring people back to, I like, just like we're talking about here, is asking people questions. Where did you get that idea from? Who told you about this? Where, are you, where did you receive that? And then I like to point people into different directions and maybe if they haven't heard from a person of color on that, on that subject particularly, they need to search that out. And for us as white people, it's easier than ever to get that um, person of color's perspective. I mean, you can, you can YouTube it, you can get on a podcast um, and, and not, I think conversations, multiracial conversations are really important, but I also think that as white communities, we need to do our own homework on this. So in our congregation, just as a framework, we tell people to research and to learn about five things. The first is history. What history do you have in your background and what is it missing in terms of race and culture? Um, my favorite one right now is 13th, the documentary. I learned none of that in high school none of it and so that's the first one the second one is definitions and terms we got to be clear about what we're talking about are we talking about individual racist acts are we talking about structural racism what are we talking about we got to be clear on the terms 
The third one is socialization. That's what white fragility does. It's also what I'm reading in Raising White Kids. Um, that's socialization. We're understanding how we're socialized and racially. The inner work that we need to do, the inner work of racism, some of those things, it gets in touch. Okay, what is this about me spiritually and personally that I need to understand about myself and how that is working for me in faith as well. And then the fifth thing is, and we've just added this one because I think it is at the forefront, anti-racist action. So as we're studying and learning, we also need to be putting this into action in some clear ways. And so those are the things in the framework that we work from at First Church that we teach on a regular basis that we're trying to come to grips on. So I hope, I hope that's helpful in some way. I'll be glad to send some resources if that's helpful. Two, two things I'd offer. One, um, with all the fear and stuff like that, earlier Dr. Furman mentioned the shield. Well, you need a shield when you're scared, when you're trying to protect something. And so helping people to name fear removes some of the threat. So I think this conversation uh, does a, a big part of that. The other thing, like I would mentioned earlier, Holly, you were talking about um, um, helping people do some research. And, and of course, my own language would be helping them see, right? When I get asked these difficult questions about, or, you know, the statements about, well, I'm colorblind and I'm this and I'm that. Um, what's funny is, is if I said that to them in the same tone, they would go, that doesn't sound right. So what I'm trying to do and helping people see is ask the question, well, what do any one of us need to see? I need a mirror. So what I'm trying to do is mirroring what I'm hearing from them. So if they said, well, uh, some of my best friends are black. So some of your best friends are black. Tell me about that. And you, you, it's a conversation. But as far as getting stuck, and, and then you, you literally are getting them to talk themselves through what ultimately, th then I'll normally get to a question that'll say, uh, what would this look like if it were different? Or what could it look like differently? You know, an action oriented question. Um, my point is, is you're trying to change hearts. Facts are not going to do that. And as much as we, the convinced need books, we need information, we need resources. Those people who are still on the other side of this, they're not even, they don't even, they're not even looking for a, an answer. They are not even asking questions. So in order to ripen people to a place of questions, you've got to have a method to, if it's mirroring, if it's, uh, um, you got to have a method to it anyway. And, and to Chris's point, here's, here's, here's two things to really consider. And, and also a, a, a point that Holly made. Um, one, um, y'all, we, we have to confess um, that theology has been weaponized. Um, and that, um, part of what we're going to hear when we start asking these questions is just flat out bad theology, wrong Bible and bad theology. You're like, what chapter and verse is that? Like, I, where did you, <laughs> um, and so in some respects, I, I think studies are important. Y'all saw me put that in the chat. If you're in a faith community, um, where they're gonna grab on to some, some stuff to study, videos, podcasts, um, books, do that and start there. If you're in a faith community that is not there, then y'all, we're gonna Jesus it. Straight Bible. Um, and begin to listen, the discovery Bible method, to Chris's point about methods, the discovery Bible method, which is just four questions. What do you see God doing in this passage? What, do you, what does this passage say about the nature of God? What does this passage say about humans? What does this passage say about what's going on in your life and, you know, what you might need to do next? Those four questions can uncover generations of bad theology that then we got to get into the pulpit and we got to get in small groups and we got to get into discipleship and tear and rip apart and help them reconstruct it in a way that is helpful for um what our mission is as the church today and then the second thing is you know it is a, it a whole other discussion to holly's point about um about whether or not you ask your black friend or your black friends, or you go do the research and study yourself. And here's the thing. Most of us think we're in a cross-cultural friendship 
and what we are is in a, we have cross-cultural acquaintances because biblically friends bear one another burden one another's burdens and if we have not been sitting with people through the hell of their lives whether that is their father passing of cancer or as my friends often do or often did when i was married sitting up and texting me through the night when I had when I was had a nursing baby until my husband got home from work because he had to go to meetings in parts of town that I didn't know if he was going to get pulled over in right until you sat with people through those hells in their realities you don't have cross-cultural friendships you have <laughs> intercultural and cross-cultural acquaintances and that is not going to get us to biblical discipleship that helps us tear this apart together because we cannot bear one another's burdens if I feel like it's it's emotional labor and not friendship. If I'm not if it's not witness, right? Our Methodist creed of ministry with, right? If I am if I am help doing something for you, if I'm keeping watch for you rather than with you, then right, it feels like I'm doing work and it's going to tire me out. And so we've got to find ways. Um, to de-weaponize the bad theology and get into just some straight good Bible about what the gospel says about making friends with people who aren't like you, breaking bread, asking questions, and seeing God in all of us, no matter who and where we are, um, which, you know, that's just good discipleship. So I'd like to get us kind of wrapped up with one final question. And, that, and this really dovetails with what uh, we were just talking about. And that is really, how do we, uh, when we encounter others uh, who are either asking these questions or um, have views that you know, we really find problematic, how do we discern what is ours to do because I, I know that like we, we're not here to fix someone, right? I mean, that's God's work. And I know there, there are things that God does. There are things that many other people in people's lives do, but how do we know um, what is ours to do and not take on um, the full bur burden of converting someone, knowing that this is a, a, probably a journey that people have got to take in community? I don't know. I, I think you have to um, be, a, first of all, I think you just have to be aware. You have to be aware that people are wrestling with this. And if you are a true leader, then you're going to provoke some kind of response to anyone who's even thinking about racial issues. Um, I think then after a few questions of, you know, a few questions and digging things, if they're, if they're putting more and more blocks in the way, I move on. They're not wanting to go further. I cannot force them to go further. And I just move on. I, I you know, you got to remember, they're already um, trying to cape up or defense up or using shields. They're already scared to death. So if I can treat, uh, and this is a white person's call, okay, this is not a person of color's call. My job is to treat tenderly this eggshell that they've handed me, because for them, that's what it is, okay? And if I handle that well enough to a person, it always goes more and more. There's always more and more behind it. And at a certain point of vulnerability, then you get to the, the long sought after breakthrough. But really, if people aren't willing to invest, and, and I may throw out some of my own um, heinous previous understandings of things, um, or some of my experiences, uh, if that provokes a, an equal response, then we can go deeper. But if they're, if they're just cutting me off, I don't want anything to do with them. I just move on. Uh, it's not their time. So, uh, um, but I also, and, I'll, and I'm going to say this, and I've got to go here in about three minutes, but I also, though, do not turn them loose to harm other people. I want to be clear, that's also the white person's burden, right? I also will go through, if they get confrontational with other people, I'm stepping in the gap. 
Okay, it's not somebody else's problem. Anyway, but. Yeah, I mean, I think it's that lifelong question as a pastor, how do you balance the prophetic with the pastoral care? Um, and you have to do that individually with every single person, uh, being able to hear and know their story, where they're coming from with, just like Chris said, with um, whether they're willing to go there, if they're ready to go there, but also I think having that bravery behind the pulpit to speak those prophetic words, but also on a day-to-day -day basis, Monday through Friday, having those individual conversations that continue to care deeply for the soul. I mean, that's hard to think, right? Like, can I care deeply for the soul of somebody who's stuck in systemic racism? Like, can I care deeply for somebody who's hurting um, or, or who is hurting both others, but also themselves? And so just being able to sit and listen to people deeply and continue to care. I mean, that's our call and it is not easy. <laughs> oh yeah, no, not easy at all. Um, Howard Thurman's question, profound question, I want to be, you know, to himself is like, to God is, I want to be more loving in my heart. And for those of you that aren't, may or may not be familiar with Howard Thurman. So Howard Thurman's great theologian out of Howard University, um, uh, contemporary of, um, of the uh, mid-century civil rights movement um, and got called out by Gandhi on a trip to um, India because he was like, how can you be a Christian ordained clergy person and bring responsible for bringing in other ordained clergy people of your community, knowing that Christianity from many of their pulpits preach that you are not human. Like how, how can you align yourself with this? Um, and sort of, he came back sort of perplexed, <laughs> like, how can I? Um, and the question then was for the rest of his theological career, like, I want to be more loving in my heart. How can I be more loving in my heart? How can I minister to people who essentially seem like they want to annihilate me? Um, and so me as a, as a discussion leader, as a facilitator, um, I've drawn a line in the sand that I've, I've told my faith community, um, I'm going to trust y'all that if there's not um, any Black people in the room that y'all aren't going to have a clan meeting. I'm going to trust y'all to unearth the things in your heart and bring them and put them out on the table. I'm not going to police that um, because what I can't do is I can't be the one that that always brings, um, I'm an Afro-Latina, so I can't be the person that brings Latinx stuff and, and Blackness and African-American stuff in the room. I'm not going to talk to you about Blackness. I will talk to you about my experiences with whiteness. I will sit with you as you unearth things that make you feel uncomfortable. And that gets to that pastoral edge that Ashley was talking about, that, that care edge is what do we do? Like, I haven't lost my father. I've lost my mother, but I haven't lost my father. It doesn't stop me from being able to sit with someone who's, who's in hospice care with their father, right? Um, there are things that we sit with people through as pastors that we do not understand, that we sit with them and we help midwife them into seeking God at their darkest moment and turning that light back on in their soul, right? Um, and that's what I feel like to Chris's point, right? Like, and Ashley's point, you've got to bring that in the room um, and ask yourself as, how can I be more loving in my heart? How can I hear these things that this person is saying that offend me because they offend my brother and sit with them through that, um, ushering them in a discovery sort of way with questions that point them to God? Because at the crux of this, even though we might be working out all the details, we know that God does not want this. God is an anti-racism God. God is a decolonial God, right? And so if we believe that, even if we haven't worked out all the details, right? Just like we believe that their father's gonna be okay. We don't know if he's gonna make it out of hospice miraculously or he's gonna be okay because he's absent from the body and present with God. We don't know exactly, but we're willing to sit with them through that. Um, Thank you, Dr. Furman. That is very powerful to me. And I, I just would answer the last question that I think this is about call. I think this is about call and who we are as Christians. I think that this is about call who we are as United Methodists. And for me, if, 
if you if you're in a situation where you think man i can't even get this discussion going just bring out those social principles they'll tell you how to get the discussion going they've got they've got the definition they've got the the call for us as christians and united methodist christians when we when we look at jesus he was an anti-racist okay he he um invited into his circle and into his touch people of different races and cultures and so and that is our call to do the same and and to fight for justice in that and jesus was not quiet about the need for justice and so i feel like that if for me it comes from the center of who i know christ to be and the call to live that out and also the center of who i know for us as united methodists um that we we um, claim to be and are working on it systemically okay we are not there yet but but the, that we have these tools at our disposal and so i would you know even john wesley is an abolitionist i mean let's lean into our faith and what we know of our faith that can really help us um help us start those conversations i mean when i talk about any of these um situations that have come up with um over the last few months in our nation we just keep reposting the social principles <laughs> and say this is what we believe this is what we believe and what i want people to hear from me is an invitation into conversation about that because it doesn't happen without conversation we need conversations with people who are um, different color and races than we are and we need conversations with our affinity groups to get straight about what scripts we're we're taking in and how we are presenting that into the world and in our faith and so Thanks, Andrew. Well, thanks. Thank you, Holly and Dr. Furman. And um, um, who else do we have with us? Ashley Ann, uh, for being here with us. I know Chris had to leave a little bit early. Um, and thank you all for being here on this conversation. Ordinarily, we'd have a little bit of uh, question and answer time. Uh, but since we're running short today, if you have questions and don't have the contact information for um, our guests who are here with us, um, email me at F-I-S-E-R, I'll put that in the chat, chat box. Um, email me and I will pass that along uh, to the person whom you need to get in touch with. And I know we're, um, uh, uh, and I would also encourage you to look on uh, our missional outreach website. Uh, for resources that are going to be updated uh, more and more throughout the weeks to come. And we're going to push those out through social media uh, as well uh, from week to week. Uh, so you'll uh, be encouraged to see those. And if you have things that you would like uh, to offer to others um, for their consideration, uh, let me know and we'll uh, try to put those out in the mix. Um, Bishop McKee, I, I know you're here with us. Uh, would you be willing to offer a benediction? as we part ways. Yeah, I'll be glad to. Thanks. Uh, and thank you all for the conversation. I enjoyed hearing it. I was taking some copious notes from some of you from, uh, or from uh, those of you who are speaking. Uh, some of you, I met the speakers. And so thank you for, for offering that well and for the work we all continue together. I especially want to thank the laity who are on the call with us today because we think this work uh, is not a work. We know that this work, we don't think this, we know that this work is not work that belongs to clergy alone, to all of, to all of us. And I remind the clergy of our of the conference, I, there were some things there that I just wanted to comment on Andrew just very quickly here. And in terms of, in some of the, you know, I overheard uh, one panelist say, you know, this is, um, this is not as, I, I heard, uh, and I just want to stress uh, a little bit of difference here that this is not, um, it's not as hard to take a stand as you think. I want to say to you, I am well aware that in some of our churches, it's hard to take a stand. Trust me, I know that. I know that because I get the emails uh, when when those stands have been taken. And so uh, I know that some of you may think, well, this isn't that hard. It's just hard in some places and uh, it's really hard. And you've got to remember that if it would not be hard if there wasn't so much systemic racism. And there is. And uh, it 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 uh, it raises its head in our churches uh, all across the conference. And it's not uh, necessarily uh, you generally think, well, there's certain places in the conference that would simply be so. And uh, let me say that it, it happens all across the conference, including in Dallas, Texas. And so it's important. I think it's important for us to acknowledge that. That being said, I want to remind you 
that, that we were talking, somebody was talking about biblical narrative related to this and about facts and, uh, you know, and using the Bible. So the first thing I want to say is facts is not going to change a thing that is exactly right. Jesus never talked in facts. He only talked in story and story and narrative is the way to change people's hearts. And so I think it's always important to do that. And the second thing is, is I can tell when I'm hearing something really good about racism or anti-racism and it's so biblically based, I do not think I'm at a political rally. And that's the challenge here. And that's where we get, that's where we rub up against and get into it. And lastly, this, to all the clergy and the laity who take stands and laity, I expect you to support your clergy, your, your, um, your clergy person, your pastor, uh, when he or she speaks or is emboldened in some way to do some, some significant act. And I do hear from when people are in a march and a protest, they're immediately, there's, there's a little bit of stuff that happens. And, and one of the things I do, clergy, is I never tell you when I get those emails. I just never tell you because I don't think it's worth worth putting up with. Uh, sometimes they're anonymous, so believe it or not. But anyway, so thank you. And remember, clergy, I always have your back. So let us pray. Holy God, for the conversation that we've had together, that is an ongoing conversation, that if we were truly honest with ourselves, that will last beyond our lifetime. But oh God, that work which you have called us to do is never ours necessarily to see come to fruition. It is simply ours to plant seeds, Maybe sometimes harvest the fruit happens, but oh God, the trust with the work that we are about is really the sanctification of our communities. And that is an ongoing work, but you will never fail us and you will never desert us. And it will, there will come those times we think this is just too hard. Well, God, it's that moment that we realize we never do this alone because not only do we work with, with colleagues like those who've assembled around together today, but we also do that work on your behalf. And we know that you're ever present in that. So as you go this way, this day, remember that God wants to introduce you to someone whom you do not, not know. And I hope that this week that someone you do not know is somebody who is very different than you. Peace. Amen. Amen. Thanks, y'all. Thank you.